Okay, so my clock says it's 7.30, so I think we're gonna go ahead and start. Hello, everyone. Um, I am extremely honored and pleased to moderate this session by Dr. Frank Gunther. Dr. Gunther is Professor of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences and Biomedical Engineering at Boston University. Dr. Gunther's research combines theoretical modeling with behavioral and neuroimaging experiments to characterize the neural computations underlying speech production. He is the originator of the DIVA model, which provides a quantitative and neural anatomically precise account of the neural computations underlying speech motor control and their breakdown in communication disorders. He has also developed brain machine interface technology aimed at restoring speech communication to severely paralyzed individuals. These topics are the focus of his 2016 book from MIT Press entitled Neural Control of Speech. Personally, I found uh, DIVA during my first year of graduate school and was instantly drawn to it because to my knowledge, there was no other neural computational model specific to speech production. There are models devoted to language processing, yes, but this one focused on the circuits of brain areas contributing to the act of speech that could be used to test hypotheses about stuttering as well. I can tell you that I've been an avid follower of Frank's work since then, and as I progressed through grad school and as a postdoc, I have forever envied his trainees because not only is Frank a brilliant scientist, he is a most generous mentor who has jumpstarted the careers of a long list of successful mentees and is also down to earth and extremely fun to be around. It has been one of the most rewarding experiences in my academic career that I have been able to collaborate with Frank on some projects and I've learned so much from our communications. I can go on, but I don't want to take any more of Frank's time. So I'm going to let Frank take over. And just a reminder to everyone, though by now I think you know the drill, uh, please go ahead and enter your questions on the Q&A box and also vote on the questions you'd like to have answered. Um, so with that, uh, Frank, let's hear from you. Great, thanks very much, Suan, for that uh, nice uh, introduction. And uh, also thanks to the organizers for inviting me. This is a, an excellent conference and I've really enjoyed uh, the presentations I've seen so far. Uh, I wanna start by acknowledging uh, my many collaborators on this work. Uh, these include former and current members of the Speech Neuroscience Lab at Boston University, as well as members of Suan's lab at University of Michigan and uh, Joe Pakel's uh, lab at MIT. So the goal of my talk today is to present an overview of a system level neurocomputational theory of stuttering and supporting evidence for this theory from both neuroscience and behavioral literatures. Uh, by systems level, I mean basically that uh, rather than worry about all the details of uh, neurotransmitter channels, et cetera, we're modeling at a, a pretty high level the whole circuit that is responsible for speech production. And in particular, today I'll talk about breakdowns in that circuit that uh, can occur that uh, uh, can contribute to stuttering. And the term neurocomputational refers to the fact that this uh, theory is defined both in terms of brain regions, so we're very specific about what brain regions are involved, but also about the computations. So the models I'll talk about today are implemented in computer simulations. I won't be talking today about uh, the equations or the simulations very much, but I'd be happy to answer questions about that if people uh, would like more information. So the talk will be broken up into two parts. Uh, in the first part, I'll provide uh, what is probably best described as a connectionist view of stuttering. This is a kind of neural uh, view where nodes, uh, which are uh, 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 fairly simplified, are connected together in a network, uh, but uh, uh, not with precise brain regions involved at this point. Um, two important things that I'll talk about. Uh, the main thing I'll talk about is the competitive Q model or CQ model of uh, uh, sequencing, and also, uh, uh, I'll talk about the idea of stuttering as incomplete competition resolution within uh, this type of model. 
Uh, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to get more specific now about the brain regions involved, and in particular, we'll be focusing on the cortico-basal ganglia thalamocortical loop. Uh, we've heard uh, a, a number of, of talks and posters about uh, malfunction in this loop and stuttering. Um, this will include first a discussion of uh, differentiating articulation of speech, so the speech motor programs, from the initiation of those motor programs, from turning on and turning off the motor programs. And uh, we'll look at impairments of the initiation portion of the circuit for speech production that may underlie stuttering-like disfluencies. Okay, well, uh, we're going to start this journey uh, with Lashley's uh, seminal paper in 1951 on serial order, and in that paper, uh, he addressed the issue of how can we use uh, motor items, and for motor items, let's think of a phoneme for now. How can we uh, have a representation in the phoneme in the brain, uh, but use that phoneme in many different sequences? We don't have a copy of every phoneme uh, representation for every sequence, uh, or so every word that we would use that phoneme in. Uh, instead, we must have something uh, more general for that. And what he proposed is that the brain contains uh, nodes, and by node here, uh, we're roughly talking about neurons in the brain, uh, probably best to think of a node as a population of neurons in the brain that represents an item. And uh, in the parallel representation described by Lashley, each node represents a motor act. So for phonemes, we might have a, a node for the phoneme P, a node for the phoneme E, and a node for the phoneme L. Um, now, the uh, elements in the uh, 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 map can be reordered in many different ways. And the way that order uh, is represented in this proposal is that at any given point in time, uh, the items in the sequence will have some activity. Those uh, neurons will have some activity. And the activity levels across the nodes encodes the serial ordering of the uh, uh, utterance. So for the word peel, for example, the P node is going to have the most activity because it's going to come first. The second most active is the E node. That means it's coming second. And the, uh, the least active uh, but still active node is the L node, and that uh, is the final node in the utterance. Now, uh, uh, so far I've uh, shown the uh, first node on the left and the second node on the right, but that doesn't have to be the case. And in fact, it's important that this representation can be shared across many different sequences. So for example, if I want to uh, produce the word leap, I can use those same nodes, but I'll have a, a different activity pattern But when I start that uh, production. L will now be the most active, E the second most active, and P the third most active. And if I want to produce plea, uh, uh, another activity pattern across the node is used in which the P is most active, uh, the L is uh, second most, uh, et cetera. So, uh, this is often called a parallel representation because all of the items in the sequence are represented, they're active at the same time, but their level of activity uh, uh, encodes the order in the sequence. Uh, this uh, representation has been used in a number of models since that time, and uh, there's been some pretty uh, striking, I think, uh, single unit uh, recordings from prefrontal cortex of uh, monkeys that show such parallel rep representations for hand movements. So uh, a monkey that's taught a sequence of movements, if you look in the prefrontal cortex, uh, you will find neurons that uh, represent items in the sequence, so uh, strokes for a hand movement, uh, uh, for example, and their activity level represents when that item is coming up in the sequence, so uh, much like this parallel representation. So there is something like this in the brain, in the motor system of the brain, uh, we uh, don't know the details yet for humans, but uh, the idea is that this is going to be something like a phoneme representation for speech. Uh, I want to point out now, I, I think it's important uh, for uh, later in the discussion, that this type of representation is a form of working memory. It's representing things that are going to come up in the utterance, and it's keeping them there while you're producing the earlier items in the utterance. So. Uh, uh, for speech, this uh, is an example of phonological working memory because we're talking about phonological uh, material, so motor programs for producing phonemes or syllables. Uh, 
uh, and that therefore it's a form of phonological working memory, which I'll uh, uh, abbreviate with PWM. Okay, well, the competitive queue model is a uh, an extension of the parallel representation that provides a mechanism for reading out a sequence from a parallel representation. So you have the sequence in memory uh, uh, represented by the activity across a set of cells. And we're going to rename this parallel representation the plan layer because it's the plan for your motor action. It's representing thing, everything simultaneously. Well, the uh, competitive queue uh, adds a second uh, layer of neurons, uh, same number of neurons and one-to-one -one correspondence to the plan layer neurons. And this is going to be called the choice layer. And this layer is where we're going to represent the current item. Um, so the choice layer is going to receive, every neuron receives excitatory input, every node from the uh, equivalent or the corresponding node in the plan layer. And it projects back to that uh, node with an inhibitory projection. And I'm using filled semicircles here to, or filled circles to represent uh, inhibitory projections. It projects back to the plan node, and that'll be uh, important for extinguishing the item when it's uh, produced. So uh, the choice layer also has uh, strong inter inhibition, uh, inhibitory connections between nodes within the choice layer. And what that does is it allows it to carry out what we call a winner-take-all competition to choose the proper item for production. So uh, the node with the largest input, in this case, the first node, will win this competition. Its item will be produced, the motor program corresponding to that node will be produced. Uh, and then when that motor program is complete, the inhibitory signal uh, projects back to the plan layer. Uh, we're gonna refer to that as a completion signal. And that inhibitory signal extinguishes the activity in the plan layer. This allows the next most active neuron to win the competition and uh, uh, the, the sequence carries on again. So I'll show that one more time. We start out, we get the first item chosen. Uh, once it's executed, it's extinguished. The second item now becomes the most active item. It's chosen, et cetera, et cetera, until we finish the sequence. So that's a competitive cue. And that's basically how it explains or describes walking through uh, uh, the sequence. Now, uh, here I'm going to, uh, for, for this entire talk, I'm more or less going to conflate two processes that may or may not be separated in the brain. Uh, these are the processes of selecting the right action, which is choosing the one that should come next and initiating that action. So I'm going to assume for most of this talk, basically, that when you select the item, it is an, an immediately produced. So selection and initiation in this view are more or less the same thing. We have a set of items, we select the right one and that one gets produced or initiated. Uh, when it's done, then we move on to the next one. Okay, so uh, here I've shown uh, in, uh, the plan layer for lists of different lengths, uh, so uh, sequences of different numbers of items. So if we have a one phoneme sequence, for example, only one node is active and that node's activity uses up all the activity in the map. We're going to assume that activity in the map, the total activity is approximately equal regardless of the number of items in the list. Uh, and this is uh, referred to in the neural network literature as normalization. So we're assuming that if uh, there are two items in the list, they're going to share that uh, total activation. And so each of those items will be less active than the one item in the first list. And if there are three items, uh, uh, again, they're sharing the activation. And so the more items there are, the less active the first node is and the other nodes in the queue. And uh, the most important uh, consequence of that is that in a CQ model, the difficulty of making a choice, uh, so the time it takes, for example, to choose the correct item depends primarily on the difference in activity between the first and second items in the queue, because that's really the, the main uh, piece of input that determines which one's going to win the competition. So I've indicated that here in the plot in the bottom left as the delta one, two. Uh, I've, I'm showing that here on the left for a, a four item sequence, uh, but let's take a look at a three item sequence. Well, in a three item sequence, what's gonna happen is that the difference uh, between the two most active items 
uh, which here is uh, delta 2-3, uh, uh, that uh, activity is going to be bigger in the shorter list. So the shorter the list, the bigger the difference between the first and second items. Uh, conversely, the longer the list, the smaller the difference and the, the more difficult it will be to, to make a decision and the longer that might take and the more problems that might occur. Okay, well, this uh, property that the uh, longer the list, the more difficult the choice fits in very nicely with one of the uh, uh, most common uh, uh, things known about uh, uh, stuttering and uh, utterance complexity, and that is that stuttering disfluencies are more frequent when the uh, utterance to be produced is longer. So the longer the sequence of phonemes you need to produce, the more difficult the choice is in this model. And the idea here is that that different, uh, difficulty is what makes stuttering more likely as the list gets longer. Okay, so next let's consider what happens when we progress through a list. So I've told you that uh, after the first item in the list is chosen and produced, we have to extinguish this item. Uh, and the reason for that is we don't wanna choose it again. It can't still be the most active item. So we have to uh, extinguish it, its representation in the plan node. And so what that means is that the plan node is going to unf unfold over time as follows. Uh, for a three-item list, at first we have all three items in the queue, and there's a relatively uh, uh, small difference between the first and second item. After we produce the first item, the, uh, there are only two items in the queue. Their activities bump up, and we get a bigger difference between the first and second item. And after the second item is produced, then we only have one item in the queue, and its uh, difference between all the other uh, uh, nodes' activities is uh, very high. Uh, and so the choice is very easy. Uh, and a consequence of this is that in any sequence, the most difficult choice is always going to be at the beginning of the sequence because that's when there are the most items in the queue. As you produce the first items, uh, fewer and fewer items are in the queue and you're less and less likely to uh, have this issue with uh, uh, small differences between uh, the first and second item and therefore more likely uh, in our model to have a stuttering disfluency at the beginning of an utterance. And this is another uh, hallmark of stuttering. Stuttering disfluencies primarily occur, overwhelmingly occur at the beginning of an utterance as opposed to say somewhere in the middle of an utterance. Okay, so, uh, so far I've showed you some pretty simple lists of uh, three or four items. Uh, to try to get a better idea of what the brain actually has to do, here what I've done is I've, I've assumed that we have 30 items. So let's imagine a, a language with 30, alf uh, uh, an alphabet of 30 phonemes. Uh, what we'll have is a node uh, for each phoneme. And the other thing I've added is some baseline activity to all of the nodes, uh, which is uh, uh, trying to get a little more uh, uh, close to what's happening in the brain. And I have an eight item sequence represented here. And although uh, it's more difficult than in the prior cases, I think most of you by visual inspection can probably see that the most active item is this one. Um, it's uh, more difficult to choose it, but it's still in this case, uh, easy to resolve by visual inspection. Uh, but let's take this a step further in terms of realistic uh, treatment of the brain. And let's consider that there's some sort of neural noise, and I'm gonna use the term neural noise uh, fairly uh, uh, vaguely here to mean something that's happening in the system that makes this representation less perfect. Uh, 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 and let's uh, start by uh, adding, uh, adding some noise and see what can happen. Well, in this plot, what I've done is I've added 5% noise and I've chosen a sample. So, Every time an eight item sequence comes up, there's 5% noise. Sometimes that's not a big problem, but other times what's going to happen is that noise will cause a reduction in the first item's activity and an increase in the second item's activity. And that can make the choice problem extremely difficult uh, or almost impossible. And so in this case, uh, I've chosen an example where the first and second items are uh, almost the same activity. And in this case, it would be very difficult to identify the first item. So if the brain uh, is having to deal with this and it's having to select the item that's going to uh, occur next, that selection might take a very long time. It, 
uh, to occur. Uh, and so nothing would be happening while you're waiting for the selection. And that basically uh, is going to be uh, within the context of speech production, uh, an example of a block uh, uh, sort of disfluency. So blocking in this case can occur because the difference between the first two items becomes too small to uh, uh, quickly make a decision. And the system takes quite a long time before it's able to initiate, choose and initiate the proper, uh, proper phoning. Uh, this is uh, what I think uh, uh, roughly approximates what's happening in stuttering, is that there's some noise somewhere in this system that makes this choice difficult, and that leads to stuttering-like disfluencies. Okay, so the overarching hypothesis then of uh, what I've uh, been describing is this. Stuttering in this view is primarily the result of an impaired action selection and in initiation process and uh, rewording it slightly to mesh better with what I'm gonna talk about uh, in the second half of the talk. Uh, stuttering is the result of impairment of the neural circuit responsible for selecting and initiating speech motor programs and uh, spoiler alert, that's going to be the cortical basal ganglia thalamocortical uh, network. Okay, so let's look a little bit more about uh, what can happen in this competition. So, so far we've assumed that the winning node is fully produced and completely deleted from the queue so it's not repeated. So uh, in a normal case, the most active uh, node uh, has quite a bit of support because there's a big difference between the first and second items. And so that node is uh, activated nicely in the choice layer, its action is produced, a completion signal is sent back, uh, we extinguish the item and the next two become active. Well, what could happen if we have a difficult choice uh, process? Well, a couple of things might happen and uh, these things uh, I'll refer to as under activation of the selected item or drop out of the selected item. Uh, first, let's look at what might happen in choice under activation. So here, uh, here's a case where now there's not that much difference between the first two items. And this might make the choice in the choice layer occur slowly over time. So instead of fully activating the node, it only, might become only partially activated. And it may take some time for, sorry, uh, for that node to become fully active before it can finally get the completion signal and extinguish the uh, plan layer representation of the, of the phony being produced. And that would lead to a prolongation stutter. So we would start to produce the item but we wouldn't be able to fully produce it. Uh, 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 we wouldn't get that completion signal for a while. That will prolong the uh, first phoneme uh, or first syllable. Uh, and then uh, only when that finally is produced do we get the completion signal that allows us to move on to the second item. So under activation of the cho chosen node uh, could lead to something like a prolongation. Well, a different thing that could happen uh, under a similar circumstance is what I'm gonna call choice dropout. And what I mean by that is, okay, again, we have a, a relatively small difference between the first and second item. We choose the uh, item kind of tentatively, maybe it's not fully chosen, uh, but that choice drops out over time, meaning that it, it doesn't have enough support. So it, it's kind of chosen that it falls out again, uh, and then it's chosen again and it falls out again. And only uh, eventually is it held long enough to finish the uh, uh, first item and extinguish its uh, representation and move on to the second item. And that would be a repetition stutter. So uh, the same mechanism, at least uh, in theory, can account for the main disfluencies in stuttering. And uh, uh, note that even in these cases where the first two items were very uh, close in activity. By the time we get to the second item, because of this normalization of the ac uh, activity in the plan layer, we get a bigger difference. And so we're much less likely by the time we get to the second item to have a disfluency of either of these types or, or a block fluency for that matter, disfluency for that matter. Okay, so, uh, this uh, more or less concludes the first half of the talk. And so uh, uh, just to review quickly, uh, we've just uh, described a competitive queuing uh, account that uh, can uh, account for 
sequencing through a, a, a list of items in an upcoming sequence, and this can account for uh, uh, these things using three main uh, aspects, a parallel representation of, of the sequence, a winner-take-all choice operation for choosing the next item and initiating it, and an extinguishing operation uh, triggered by a completion signal to remove the uh, produced item from the queue. Uh, I've shown how this mechanism is capable of counting, accounting for the following traits of stuttering, a block, which could occur when it's very difficult to choose the first item and the choice takes a long time. Uh, and uh, this could be due to uh, some sort of noise in the system. Prolongations, which uh, might occur if the difference is a little bit bigger, but still not uh, big enough to fully activate the uh, first item. So it only partially engages and only slowly builds up over time, therefore starting the item, but not fully extinguishing it uh, until uh, 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 much later, so we have a prolongation of the first item, or a repetition where uh, we may have a choice that's made, but it drops out intermittently uh, uh, and only eventually uh, stays active long enough to carry out the entire uh, first item and move on to the second item, and this would result in stopping and restarting uh, the first uh, uh, motor program. And I've also shown how the same mechanism naturally accounts for two of the most widely reported aspects of stuttering. Uh, disfluencies are more frequent for longer utterances because there's a smaller difference between the first and second items. And uh, disfluencies are more frequent at the beginning of an utterance uh, for basically the same reason. The, the list is longest uh, when you're at the beginning and therefore, uh, again, you have the smallest difference between the first and second items. Okay, so let's take a little break uh, and before starting the second uh, uh, part of the talk. Uh, so this so far has been a, a, a fairly vague uh, connectionist account. Now we're going to move into a more specific account where we're going to associate particular brain regions to the uh, different components of this model. And in particular, we're going to focus on the cortico-basal ganglia thalamocortical loop, which I'm going to call the uh, cortico-BG loop in, uh, for short here. And uh, we'll start by uh, separating out two aspects of speech production, and these are the uh, uh, processes of initiating a motor program and articulating that motor program. Uh, this slide shows uh, a schematic of the full uh, DIBA model, which is, as Suan mentioned, a neurocomputational model of speech production. Uh, and the model really deals with producing a single item, is the way you should uh, think of that. Uh, and it breaks up the process into uh, a feed-forward control system. So this is reading out your motor programs from memory, and a feedback control system, which is involved in correcting movements based on sensory feedback. Well, we're going to focus on the feed-forward control system here because that's where stuttering is most likely to uh, 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 lie, and that's where we have this initi initiation circuit. And one thing to note about this circuit is that it's left lateralized uh, in the brain, especially in the ventral premotor cortex, the highest level in the model, which represents the different speech sounds that could be produced in the language. And a speech sound here could either be a phoneme or a syllable, I'd be happy to discuss uh, that distinction uh, uh, during the question period. Um, the rest of the circuit is largely bilateral, but because the uh, uh, input, the main uh, uh, part of the circuit is in the left ventral premotor uh, cortex, uh, the circuit uh, 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 is left lateralized. We're gonna treat it as left lateralized for our purposes today. And, uh, uh, and that left lateralization will primarily be in the frontal cortex and subcortical structures associated with it. Um, the feed-forward control, uh, control system in DIVA has two distinct cortico, cort subcortical circuits. The first of these is the initiation circuit. That's what we're gonna be most uh, uh, concerned with here. This heavily involves the supplementary motor area as well as, as well as the basal ganglia. So this is the cortico-basal ganglia thalamocortical loop, and I'm gonna spend uh, much of the rest of the talk unpacking that loop. The second uh, circuit is the articulation circuit. This circuit involves direct projections from ventral premotor cortex to primary motor cortex, uh, 
as well as an important contribution uh, from a cerebellar loop. So from the cortex to the pons to the cerebellar uh, cortex, uh, in particular lobule six, it turns out, then to the thalamus, uh, and then to motor cortex. Uh, this circuit carries the feed forward motor commands. So this circuit has the precisely timed movements that you need to produce a phoneme or syllable uh, represented in it. It reads them out from memory, uh, essentially. Um, so the articulation circuit uh, uh, then generates the complex muscle activation patterns that move the articulators. Uh, we'll call those motor programs for now. Uh, and the initiation circuit's uh, responsibility is turning on and turning off these motor programs at the right times. Uh, so the initiation circuit doesn't contain all the details of the motor programs. It just turns them on and turns them off. The details are in the uh, ventral premotor cortex, cerebellum, uh, et cetera. Okay. Uh, an analogy that might be uh, helpful uh, for some of you is uh, uh, the inner workings of a jukebox. So uh, uh, I don't know if these even exist anymore, but uh, back in the day, the jukebox had an electromechanical subsystem that was responsible for determining which song to play next and when to start it. So based on all the songs that were requested that are queued up, it picks the most requested one and starts it at the right time. And the right time is when the current song is finished. Uh, and this is analogous to our initiation system in speech production. Uh, uh, and this circuit is the cortico basal ganglia thalamocortical circuit in the brain. The jukebox also has a second, second electromechanical subsystem that has to play the music on the CD, or if we go even further back in time, on the record uh, made of vinyl. Uh, and so the music encoded on the CD is the equivalent of a motor program here. And this is analogous to the articulation system. And that would be the cortico cerebellar loop. Uh, and so what we're proposing here is that the root cause of stuttering isn't the motor programs themselves. It's actually the initiation system. The motor programs themselves could be fine. Uh, and the motor programs here, of course, analogous to the CDs and the jukebox, the CDs might be fine. It just might be the system that has to start the CDs that's not working. Uh, uh, although this is uh, uh, true that it could be uh, completely uh, fine, the uh, motor program, it's also possible, and we'll see some evidence that maybe the motor program isn't completely fine. Uh, maybe it is a little bit impaired, and that might actually uh, contribute to stuttering disfluencies. Okay, uh, to give you an idea of uh, uh, how the uh, DIVA model works, I'm gonna show some uh, very old simulations now that were put together. Uh, I believe these were put together by Oren Sivier in the lab uh, uh, over 10 years ago, around 10 years ago. Um, uh, and what I'm gonna uh, demonstrate is a, a repetition stutter. So recall in our competitive Q amount uh, account of repetition, uh, we have underactivation. Uh, this leads to dropout of the choice. Uh, it keeps uh, winning again, but dropping out. Eventually, it stays in there and uh, extinguishes its plan layer representation, and we move on to the other items in the utterance. Okay, next I'm going to show a simulation of the DIVA model uh, fluently producing the utterance good doggy, uh, which is a, a, a test utterance that we train it. Uh, and so here uh, you'll see the articulators moving because the model is controlling these articulators and we're synthesizing a sound signal and you'll hear the sound output and see the articulators move as it fluently produces this sound. Good doggy. Okay. Good doggy. Uh, I hope you can hear that. Uh, but uh, uh, that is a, a normal Good production ca uh, production case. Uh, now what we're gonna do in this uh, last simulation is show what can happen in a repetition disfluency. So in this simulation, the motor program is the same motor program, it's fine, but what we're gonna do is start and, and, re and stop and, and restart and stop uh, as I showed in the CQ account. So we're gonna turn the motor program on and off before finally keeping it on. And this will lead to a repetition stutter in the model. Good, 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 good. 
Uh, I should note that uh, in addition to the stutter, the pitch profile here is uh, quite different, uh, which gives it a bit of a robotic uh, uh, sound that has nothing to do with stuttering. Um, but the key behavior here you can see is this repetition and uh, beginning and 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 then uh, uh, restarting of the motor program. Good, 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 good. Okay, so that that uh, that's basically what the Diva model does. I'm not going to go into detail in the model uh, other than the cortical bas basal ganglia loop. And uh, to cover that, I'd like to start with uh, a couple of uh, important kind of base facts about the basal ganglia. First of all, the basal ganglia lie between cerebral cortex, which is the outermost part of the brain, and the thalamus uh, nestled uh, uh, toward the uh, middle of the brain. Uh, and so the basal ganglia sit underneath cortex and they receive input from a vast amount of cortex. Uh, and this means that they're very well suited to monitor what's going on in cortex. And what's going on in cortex is I'm planning my utterance, A, and I also have a, a very detailed representation of the current state of, of the somatosensory system, of the motor system, of the auditory system, et cetera. And all that information I can use to make a decision about what to do next and when to do it. Uh, then the basal ganglia project to, uh, well, first the information gets funneled into fewer and fewer channels within the basal ganglia. Then it gets projected to the thalamus, which lie underneath the basal ganglia, and then back to cortex. But by the time it goes back to cortex, there were far, far, far fewer channels uh, than we had in the input part of the basal ganglia. Uh, and what that means uh, is that basically the basal ganglia likely don't have enough output channels to control all the details of the movement. Instead, what they're doing is they're gating on part of cortex that represents the movement and then that part of cortex does its thing and reads out the movement. So there are few output channels because they're just one per motor program, as opposed to having many, many output channels per motor program to deal with all the different articulators that have to be uh, timed and coordinated uh, to produce uh, speech. Okay, so this uh, loop from cortex to the basal ganglia to the thalamus and back to cortex, uh, uh, the cortical basal ganglia thalamic cortical loop, uh, was discovered in the 80s and uh, mapped out uh, quite well by Alexander and colleagues in monkeys. And they noted that there are multiple corticobasal ganglia loops, not just one. Um, and we're going to focus uh, on uh, one of them, which is called the motor loop. And the motor loop receives input from premotor cortex, motor cortex, somatosensory cortex. And uh, uh, these areas project to the putamen, which is part of the striatum, which is the input part of the basal ganglia. Uh, and the output of this loop projects through the ventral lateral or VL nucleus of the thalamus to cortex. Uh, it projects to many parts of cortex, but in particular, with a very heavy projection, it projects to the supplementary motor area, which is a premotor cortical area on the midline. Uh, uh, so it's a medial premotor cortical area as opposed to the lateral premotor cortex, which I'll be referring to simply as premotor cortex or ventral premotor cortex. Okay, so the motor loop is what we'll focus on. I'll, I'll unpack that later. There are many other loops. Uh, and in 1996, uh, Mink was the first to propose something that now uh, many uh, 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 people uh, uh, believe and ascribe to, and that is that the basal ganglia loop, the motor loop, acts to select the proper motor act in the current context. And by context, I mean what's happening in the world, what's happening in my body. Uh, and the way it does that is it inhibits competing motor acts. And this occurs via the indirect pathway of the basal ganglia, which uh, many of you will be familiar with. I'm not going to talk much about the indirect and direct pathways uh, uh, beyond this slide. But again, I'm happy to discuss them in more detail later. Um, and in addition to that, it disinhibits uh, uh, the correct motor act. And I say disinhibit instead of excite because the basal ganglia uh, primarily involves inhibitory projections. Uh, and so what you're really doing is turning off inhibition of the thalamus for the motor act that you want to complete and turning on or, or, or increasing inhibition of the thalamus for motor acts that you don't want to do in the current context. 
And that basic, uh, that basic idea is uh, uh, going to be, uh, we're just going to adopt that, that basically the selection process and in our case, initiation process uh, involves the basal ganglion motor loop. Um, and there's plenty of evidence for that, but there's no time to go through all of that for this talk. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is morph the competitive Q model into the basal ganglia loop. So this is kind of like a Rosetta Stone to get us from the first part of the talk to the second. So we have our plan layer and our choice layer and connections in between. Well, this is roughly the equivalent uh, 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 with anatomical labels. So the plan layer we believe is in the cerebral cortex. Um, we'll get more specific later about that. It projects to the basal ganglia and then to the thalamus and that loop back to cortex is what's doing the choice. Keep in mind that the choice here is much harder than the inhibition. Uh, the choice requires monitoring all kinds of stuff to determine which one's most active and if when's the right time in order to, to initiate that item. That requires the circuitry of the basal ganglia, but once you initiate an item and it's completed, you know what plan, there's no, uh, it's easy to uh, uh, inhibit the correct item because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the chosen items and the plan layers. And so uh, the extra circuitry here, the basal ganglia circuitry is involved primarily in the choice. Uh, and then the uh, choice is sent to another part of cortex, which then inhibits the plan part of cortex. Uh, in this uh, panel, I've elaborated that uh, a little further by breaking up, uh, first of all, changing the uh, uh, layout so that it met better matches figures later in the talk, but also uh, opening up the uh, basal ganglia box and breaking it up into the striatum, which uh, is the putamen and caudate nucleus, the putamen being the motor part of the striatum, uh, the caudate nucleus being uh, more cognitive and, and sensory parts of the striatum. Uh, the globus pallidus, uh, the substantia nigra pars reticulata, which is uh, these two together form the output channel of the basal ganglia. Those inhibit the thalamus, and in particular, they inhibit uh, the ventral anterior uh, thalamus, which uh, uh, projects heavily to premotor cortical areas, and the ventral lateral thalamus, which projects heavily to primary uh, cortex. So basically, uh, uh, we're uh, now, uh, uh, we move from this kind of vague connectionist model to a more complete neural circuit. And let's uh, flesh that circuit out a bit more. So another thing we have to consider uh, is sensory motor context. So a lot of what I'm talking about today uh, was influenced heavily by a, a, a really great piece of work by Per Alm uh, uh, in his uh, uh, dissertation, which was published in uh, an article in 2004, where he uh, outlines a, a lot of evidence for the core dysfunction and stuttering being an impaired ability of the basal ganglia to produce timing cues for initiating the next motor program, the upcoming motor program in speech. And this is basically the idea that we're using here. We're fleshing this out. Uh, the timing signal here is the completion signal I discussed above, which is the signal that says, I'm done with the current item. Let's move on to the next item. Well, in order to determine exactly when to generate the next item, I need to know more than just what items are in the sequence. I also need to know where I am in producing the current item. And I'm gonna to refer to that as sensory motor context. My motor system's doing something, I'm receiving sensory feedback, I'm receiving auditory feedback. When those systems tell me I'm almost done with the current sound, then and only then should I initiate the next sound. And so in addition to the plan layer, the striatum needs to uh, monitor sensory motor context in order to appropriately initiate uh, uh, an upcoming sound. And this is mediated by projections from the premotor cortex, the somatosensory cortex and the motor cortex uh, in monkeys, all of which provide uh, motor and somatosensory context of the ongoing movement um, and in speech, auditory cortical regions are going to factor heavily into this uh, because they are uh, uh, kind of, a, uh, you know, they tell you what uh, your motor system is actually doing. And so when the auditory system is hearing that I'm almost done, uh, then we're ready to initiate. 
Okay. Um, so that's the basal ganglia loop. Uh, I've described it as a single loop. Uh, for speech, however, uh, it's a bit more complicated to that than that. And we have an elaboration of the DIVA model that we call the gradient ordered order DIVA model or the go DIVA model, which uh, adds a higher level to this circuit, which is the level of planning where we have our uh, uh, Q representation. And it allows uh, the model to address sequencing of multiple motor programs. And this is done using a CQ architecture. Well, the beige area here of the Godiva model is the same as the Diva model. This is basically the initiation circuit uh, of the Diva model. Um, uh, and so this is the motor loop uh, uh, for speech. It involves the putamen of the basal ganglia uh, of the striatum and mostly the VL nucleus and maybe a little of the VA nucleus of the thalamus. Um, in addition, the Godiva model adds a planning layer that goes into more prefrontal cortical areas uh, that we believe are representing the plan for the utterance. And these involve the pre-SMA, which is uh, a premotor area that feeds into the SMA for sequencing, and the posterior inferior frontal sulcus in the left hemisphere. Uh, and this, we believe, contains the phonological content of the utterance. What are the phonemes that are going to be produced? And uh, the planning loop, we believe, uh, involves slightly more anterior uh, portions of the striatum, uh, so the head of the caudate nucleus uh, in particular, and it's going to mostly involve the ventral anterior nucleus of the thalamus interacting with these premotor areas. So together, the parallel plan representations in PIFS and uh, pre-SMA constitute the phonological working memory of the utterance in the Godiva model, and the motor loop basically is uh, uh, producing that final choice and initiating the uh, 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 next phoneme in the, in the utterance. Okay. Well, again, uh, we have left lateralization, especially in this planning loop, and particularly in the uh, inferior frontal sulcus. And uh, this makes sense because language is left lateralized, and the representation in this phonological contact buffer is basically the output of the linguistic system, meaning that uh, it's a uh, the phonological content of the upcoming utterance uh, that uh, is formulated in the left hemisphere, and uh, that uh, feeds into the uh, feed forward control system uh, through the left ventral premotor cortex uh, speech sound map in the model. Okay. Well, uh, again, I'm not going to go into much detail on the Godiva model other than to add its components into this cortico-basal ganglia loop for speech sequencing and initiation. Uh, so here now I have uh, basically lumped the uh, motor and planning loops uh, for the purposes of exposition to make it easier to uh, 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 describe the remainder of the talk, uh, which has to do with malfunctions in this loop. And what we'll see, and we've heard a lot about it already, is that malfunctions anywhere in the left hemisphere could potentially cause or contribute to stuttering disfluencies. Uh, and so that's what we'll uh, be looking at for the remainder of the talk. And we'll start out with neurogenic stuttering. So neurogenic stuttering is typically stuttering caused by stroke. So the person was fluent, a uh, fluent speaker, they had a stroke, uh, and this stroke led to stuttering. Um, uh, Tace and colleagues uh, performed uh, a, a neuroimaging study using voxel-based lesion symptom mapping where uh, stuttering dif disfluencies were the symptom. Uh, uh, we have a lesion map for every subject and we can determine which voxels in the brain are most associated with stuttering disfluencies. That's what they did. And they found a set of, of, of nine areas. And uh, these areas include the putamen and the caudate body, so that's the striatum, so red X here, indicating that in the model. The inferior frontal cortex, which involves the uh, inferior frontal sulcus. The white matter beneath the inferior frontal sulcus. The inferior parietal cortex, which has the somatosensory cortex. White matter beneath that. The superior temporal cortex, which is the auditory cortex. White matter beneath the auditory cortex. The, and the white matter of the internal capsule, which has a number of these other pathways, uh, uh, white matter from another, a number of these other pathways in it. Um, so that was the one study. 
Uh, there have been a number of other studies, of course, on neurogenic stuttering, and other uh, areas that uh, come up are the globus pallidus in the basal ganglia, the thalamus, uh, and finally, the SMA and the pre-SMA. So here are all the areas that are associated for, with stuttering, neurogenic stuttering, and this is almost a complete coverage of the uh, uh, basal ganglia thalamocortical loop for speech. Um, but one uh, interesting thing that I still don't uh, uh, know for sure uh, uh, what it means, but uh, I have some uh, thoughts, uh, is that we don't see uh, neurogenic stuttering cases that involve left ventral premotor cortex or ventral motor cortex. Uh, they are part of this loop, but they're also part of the articulation circuit. They're the key components of the articulation circuit. And it's possible that damage to the articulation circuit directly has more severe consequences than stuttering. And that's why stuttering uh, is not reported, uh, uh, but that's, uh, that's uh, pretty much speculation uh, at this point. Okay, uh, so another uh, uh, aspect of stuttering, uh, or at least another theory of stuttering, uh, is that stuttering may involve excess dopamine in the striatum. And there was a study by Wu and colleagues in the McGuire lab that showed uh, for a, a, a small set of people who stutter, there was a highly elevated uh, dopamine level, sorry, in the uh, striatum uh, of these uh, uh, individuals. And that was proposed to possibly be a cause of stuttering. Well, uh, something that's in keeping with that is that uh, uh, levodopa, which is a, a, a common treatment for Parkinson's disease and increases striatal dopamine, uh, there have been many, uh, a number of reports, at least, of exacerbated or causing uh, or, or increase uh, uh, um, the beginning of stuttering in people uh, under levodopa uh, treatment, and that that fits in pretty well with the idea that maybe excess dopamine can somehow impair the choice process here. Well, what we believe is happening is that excess dopamine in the striatum, uh, because of the actions of dopamine on the direct and indirect pathways. The net effect of that is to overexcite cortical regions that receive basal ganglia input, uh, and these include our planning areas. And if we do that, if we overexcite the plan, uh, I've kind of schematized what we uh, think might happen here. We have neurotypical case where we have differences in activation that are clear, but if all of the uh, neurons are overactive, we get a ceiling effect, and the differences between the first and second items get smaller. And that makes the decision, uh, the choice, uh, more difficult. Uh, we've actually performed computer simulations of the Godiva model, and we've verified that that can, in fact, lead to stuttering-like disfluencies in the model. And interestingly, we also found that too little dopamine can, uh, uh, in the model at least, cause stuttering-like disfluencies. And in this case, it's more like a floor effect. Uh, too little dopamine means too little excitation, and again, we get a loss of dynamic range and a, uh, a loss of difference between the first two items, and again, that would cause uh, difficulties, and this suggests uh, something that I think is a very important theme, which is there are very likely different stuttering subtypes. There might even be extreme differences in the subtypes, like in this case, where it's kind of an opposite situation with respect to dopamine. And of course, we would want to probably treat people differently depending on which subtype they have. Uh, we don't know for sure that these two subtypes exist, but uh, at least according to the model, that uh, is a possibility. Um, uh, we've also heard a lot about anatomical uh, anomalies in children with uh, persistent developmental stuttering. Uh, Suwan had an excellent presentation yesterday about this. And among other things uh, that's been found, uh, Cortical Garnett and colleagues, uh, so a co collaboration between Sue N's lab and ours, found cortical thickness anomalies in the left ventral premotor cortex and motor cortex of children uh, who stutter compared to both neurotypical children uh, uh, and uh, children who recover from stuttering. Uh, this, in the basal ganglia loop, the main effect of this would be impaired ability to sense the right motor context and determine when the current sound is done in order to start the next sound. Um, but it's important to note that that is one thing that could happen, but we might also expect uh, impairment in the articulation circuit. So this might indicate that the motor programs themselves might not be uh, uh, perfect also, 
and that would impair the ability to uh, recognize when to in initiate uh, uh, speech. So uh, that could have a, uh, a couple of different effects uh, that uh, uh, cause or exacerbate stuttering. Interestingly, uh, Garnett also uh, uh, found two anomalies that were only in recovering uh, uh, kids. So kids who recovered from stuttering compared to both neurotypical and, uh, 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 children and children whose stuttering persists had local gyrification uh, that was lower in pre-SMA. Uh, there's no time to go through the details of that, but basically it's an anatomical difference between the pre-SMA of children who, uh, pr uh, who recover from stuttering compared to both neurotypicals and uh, children whose stuttering persists. And there's also a decrease in LGI with age in the SMA only in children whose uh, stuttering uh, recovers. Uh, so these uh, results suggest that something about these areas, which in the Godiva model are representing the sequential structure or the kind of the order of the utterance and the initiation of the motor program, structural differences might make it easier uh, uh, for uh, uh, these uh, children to recover from stuttering to compensate for problems in, elsewhere in the initiation circuit. Um, there are uh, also a number of studies that found connectivity anomalies in stuttering, um, and they typically show uh, problems in the left hemisphere circuit. And an example of this is Kai and colleagues, uh, Kai and colleagues who identified tracks that had significant correlations with stuttering, and they found that all of the tracks with a significant negative correlation, meaning weaker tracks correspond with more stuttering, were in the left hemisphere. And all of the, uh, uh, this suggests that weak white matter connectivity may in this hemisphere may exacerbate stuttering. Uh, but all the ones with positive correlations were in the right hemisphere. Uh, and our interpretation of that is that these probably represent mechanisms that are forced into action because of impairments in the left hemisphere. They become overused in stuttering, and this is why we have increased white matter in these areas. Uh, finally, uh, I'll, uh, it's been noted uh, uh, by a number of researchers that auditory ma manipulations uh, can Im improve fluency in stuttering. Uh, these include masking the noise of the speaker or altering the frequencies of the speaker's uh, formants or pitch, uh, pitch in particular, or delaying auditory feedback. Um, in our view, uh, what is happening is that these uh, things make the speech sound, uh, uh, the, the feedback unreliable. It doesn't uh, reliably represent what you're uh, trying to do. And so the system may uh, learn to ignore that uh, over time uh, and basically uh, just uh, remove uh, auditory uh, input effectively from the cue. Uh, and this could improve fluency in a couple of ways. It could prevent detection of auditory errors that might otherwise impede initiation of the next motor program, or it could also reduce the amount of information in the queue. And I've shown how reducing the number of items in the queue can make the choice easier. Uh, and so again, this might improve uh, fluency and stuttering by making the choice easier. Okay, so to summarize, uh, stuttering disfluencies are well modeled by impaired action selection and initiation in a CQ type model in which the size of the activity advantage of the most active item in the queue determines the speed or quality of the action, action selection. So normally when there's a fairly big difference, we get uh, action completion and extinguishing and move to the next action. Uh, if we have a little bit less difference, we might get an incomplete activation that drops out uh, for the choice. And this would be something like a repetition stutter that uh, 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 only eventually uh, uh, resolves. Uh, prolongation might occur with even more uh, of a difference where we, it takes a very, very long time to activate the first uh, node. And in really extreme cases, we might have a block where nothing can occur for a very long time until very, finally we're able to make a choice. Uh, this mechanism naturally explains why disfluencies are more frequent for longer utterances and are more frequent at the beginning of, of an utterance. Uh, the cortical basal ganglia loop is the brain's action selector. Uh, abnormal structure or function in any of the structures in the loop could potentially uh, uh, impair selection and cause stuttering. Uh, but we've seen also that other anomalies may aid in recovery. Um, 
I have some future directions here, but in the interest of time, I'm uh, going to stop there. And uh, thank you for listening. Uh, and thanks again to the organizers. Thank you so much, Frank. That was just fantastic. Now, I know uh, looking at the time, um, we, we are out of time. However, the next thing on the schedule is a, a break, a 30 minute break. And given that we have tons of questions for Frank, I wonder if we can devote about 10, 15 minutes maybe uh, to um, have a Q&A session for those who are available to um, still be here. So I'll go ahead and um, start asking at least one question, Frank. Um, I'll try to um, coalesce some of these. So one question is, how do other factors such as increased language formulation, complexity, social pressures, and especially emotional regulation impact the initiation of the motor pattern? How do these and other factors interact with your model? And people had a particular interest in how emotion um, interacts. Okay, uh, that's a great question. And I think the answer is uh, that phonological working memory is impacted by these things. So stress is going to be something uh, 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 or emotional uh, 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 anxiety. These things will basically add noise to the plan representation. And by, uh, you know, how that happens mechanistically, not clear, certainly. But the basic idea is that the more noise you add to this phonological working memory representation, the worse your phonological working memory is and the, the worse the problems are for choosing uh, the next item. So I think these uh, uh, many of these things which have a, a very big influence on uh, stuttering probably act by making the uh, uh, dynamic, like decreasing the dynamic range in phon phonological working memory, uh, uh, roughly equivalent to the adding of neural noise uh, to the plan representation. Okay, great. Uh, next one. Uh, this is an interesting question. Um, how is it that people who stutter can make fluent asides, such as, gosh, this is difficult, during the moment of stuttering, and then continue stuttering where they left off? Uh, that is a very good question. Uh, so first, automated, so some things uh, maybe just, uh, we know that, uh, you know, the, the more frequently you say something, the less likely you are to stutter, uh, uh, roughly speaking. And so uh, uh, things that you say frequently uh, may just be more robust to stuttering. And uh, uh, so you can kind of think of those as automatic things that you just you start and it, it uh, reads out as opposed to having to make a choice amongst a bunch of different actions. I know this is a hand wavy explanation, but that's basically uh, uh, the best we have right now uh, for that sort of thing. But note that noise doesn't always make the choice harder. Sometimes noise could actually make the choice easier. Um, uh, that doesn't necessarily account for this because that is really, you know, uh, uh, comparing different times when you produce a, a, a difficult utterance as opposed to these cases where you're uh, able to read something out quickly. But uh, uh, anyway, those are my thoughts as currently formulated. Okay, I'll move on to the next one. How does this model account, oops, um, account for stuttering variability either over time, such as weeks, months of increased uh, speech fluency followed by uh, more disfluencies, or types of disfluencies. So, for example, this person used to stutter on certain words and sounds, and now they don't. So, how how do you account for variability? Well, so first, just from day to day, the amount of noise in your system is different. Like, did you have caffeine this morning? Are you stressed out? All these things affect the noise in the in the brain, and that will affect the uh, phonological working memory representation and make it uh, potentially more difficult to uh, make choices. Um, over longer periods of time, you may be able to uh, uh, better, you know, uh, uh, yeah, you just, uh, the system may just get better at things that it produces more frequently uh, by, uh, you know, uh, having that motor programs be better encoded. Uh, a number of different things like that can happen over time. 
Um, but your system is changing over time. Your white matter changes over uh, at least till you're 10 years old. So uh, well after stuttering uh, starts, you're continuing to develop. So uh, development is still occurring in the brain for a while. And then uh, you may be able to, you know, if you practice really hard on certain things, you may be able to build better programs so that there's less chance of not being able to recognize when to initiate the next sound. Okay. All right. Next question. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Does this model explain the fluency enhancing techniques such as choral speech, delayed auditory feedback, and masking noise, et cetera? Yeah. So for a lot of those, I, I think what's happening is that you're ignore, you learn to ignore uh, your own speech feedback where, where, over short periods of time, at least. Uh, so delayed auditory feedback, masking noise, I think those things that kind of mask your voice in some way or another are probably just removing focus from auditory feedback, and that helps make the choice easier by you don't hear the auditory errors uh, that might be happening, small errors that might stop the initiation, and you reduce the information in the cue. Um, so uh, the choral speech uh, and rhythmic speech, which is another, so metronome time speech, I think what's happening there is that they are taking over the active, the initiation process, like the, the external cues are telling you when to initiate. You don't have to rely, you can't rely on uh, uh, internal cues uh, in those cases because you have to, you're basically getting the cues from outside. You're either getting it from the metronome and that activates some other neural circuit that's not problematic in your brain, um, or you're getting it from other people who are speaking with you. Uh, uh, and so, that helps overcome the choice and initiation problem uh, by giving you the timing signals, more or less. And this more, I think this is pretty much the same explanation that Peralm uh, 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 provided uh, in his modeling. Okay. All right. Next question. Have you looked into the role of attention in interfering with initiation of the motor program? Stutterers often pay attention to the words they will say. How does this affect the system? Uh, we, well, we've not looked at it. I can speculate. Attention might allow you to better represent uh, things in the plan. Like it, it, So uh, attention would be adding more neural resources to that task that may decrease the noise in the phonological working memory uh, uh, mechanism, uh, which would increase uh, fluency. Um, however, attention might also have negative, like if you're attending to yourself, not doing it properly, for example, that might uh, exacerbate the problem by adding stress-related noise to the system. So uh, I think that's a very important area for research, but, uh, and we haven't looked much into it, but those are, again, my, my thoughts on the topic. Okay, and then we have a question about cluttering. Um, thank you for the stunning presentation. What do you think could happen with a person who clutters that does telescoping or coalescence of syllables? That's a great question. And I think cluttering might be a case where more than one thing becomes active in the choice uh, uh, network. So if you're not competing strongly enough in the choice, a couple of things could kind of become active simultaneously, maybe not equally, but uh, if that happened, you'd start reading out multiple motor programs or uh, start reading out motor programs too early. That would lead to this overlapping uh, 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 issue, and uh, uh, that may be what's happening in cluttering, I think. Okay. Um, next question is, so based on this model, how can therapy help people who stutter to improve fluency? Whew, yeah, I think, I mean, I can, it, I guess it might help you focus on, like, if you have a better understanding of, of the issue and how it relates to phonological working memory, you may be able to uh, uh, work on things that help improve uh, uh, the phonological repre representations. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, off the top of my head, I, I, I don't know how to do that uh, therapeutically. I think we're a bit, it's a bit down the road before we'll be directly impacting therapy. But I think, you know, this is a very important step because therapy will 
uh, successful therapy, I think, will depend on proper subtyping. If you don't, like, if if it's true that there are different types of stuttering due to different parts of the system being uh, uh, abnormal, then, uh, the, yeah, you uh, you uh, so well, yeah. I don't. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> I don't want to uh, get myself in too. Yeah, and I, I also want to agree with that. I, this kind of basic research um, is so critical to lead to and pave the way for any kind of subtype-based, individual-specific treatment um, right. in the future. So it, I, I, it's totally fine that uh, we don't have direct clinical implications at this point, but but to get there, these are the, the elemental steps that need to be taken. Yeah, that's the way I look at it. And I think what this can help us do that's very important in that is, is figure out what the subtypes are so, uh, and figure out which ones are, have to be treated differently. Uh, right. uh, uh, because, uh, for example, if it's true that excess dopamine causes one type and not enough dopamine can cause another type, well, we shouldn't be doing the same thing to treat uh, those two types uh, uh, probably, or at least there are some things that we can do that will help one, but not help the other, or may even uh, uh, make the other worse. And I'm thinking not just about, uh, you know, behavioral therapies here, but also potential drug therapies and, and maybe even stimulation uh, therapies down the road, like deep brain stimulation or something along those lines. Yeah. So we're, we're 10 minutes past the um, time, but unless somebody yells at me, I, I think I'm going to keep going. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, is that okay, Frank? Sure. Okay. Just maybe a couple more questions. It's oh. okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Um, if you if you would like to do another five minutes, and then that's yeah. still um, a little bit of time before the next session. That Got would it. be great. But thank you very much. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. I, I think we can. You know, maybe do like two or three more questions, and that'll be it. Okay. Um, just going down the line again. I'm wondering if this model could account for typical or non-stutter dysfluencies, such as interjections, um, 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 something like that. Oh. I, I think those are probably more linguistic in the sense of you haven't found the word yet that you want to say. It's not that you can't read out the phonological material. You're just not sure what you want to say yet. So uh, to me, that's a slightly higher level in the system. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so I, at this point, I don't think of it as accounting for those. Okay. All right. And then next is, how could these research findings be best described or explained for the parents of children who stutter? Uh, yeah, that's a, uh, you know, it's a tough one. I, I think probably the best thing would be to say that, you know, there they have a when you produce speech you have to uh, uh keep uh in mind at the same time the things that you all the the sounds that you have to say uh and the more of those there are the harder it is to choose which one to do next I'm, you know something along those lines uh but again i don't know that that's going to help them you know resolve the stuttering for their uh children but uh i think that's the closest uh, kind of very simple explanation, well, somewhat simple explanation of, of uh, what's happening. Okay. All right. Next one is, if difficulty selecting certain motor programs underlies stuttering, why is it not effective for people who stutter to reformulate motor programs, for example, by word substitutions during a speech act? What, so I think Word subs so word substitutions are outside the scope of this in that they would be again a, a linguistic uh, level uh, description. So that I think those things happen before you get to the problem in many cases. So somebody anticipates that they're going to stutter. They don't even load that word into the queue. They try to find another word to load into the queue to use instead that won't won't cause a stutter. Maybe a shorter word or a more common word that they produce more frequently. And therefore, that word has a better representation in working memory that's more robust. Okay, I, and I think I'll uh, do this last question. Um, how much of potential subtyping do you think occurs as a result of speech experiences, compensations compared to etiologic features? Uh, that is a, a, 
very uh, 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 good question as well. And I think in so uh, part of why I think your work is so important, Suan, is that uh, early on you don't have as many secondary characteristics happening. They do start, you know, still in childhood, but. Uh, the earlier you uh, uh, study someone who uh, has a, a severing issue, the more likely you are to uh, see primarily the cause of the stuttering as opposed to secondary things. In adults, it's very difficult. So, for example, I showed the slide where they, adults who stutter have weakened white matter pathways in the left and strengthened white matter pathways in the right. The strengthened white matter pathways in the right I personally think probably happens because those pathways are forced into action and they should, they don't need, you know, they normally shouldn't be, they uh, normally the left hemisphere should be doing the job, but in adults, that right hemisphere circuit's been active so much over time that it's built up the strength of those white matter pathways. So in adults, I think it's important, uh, uh, especially important to distinguish between things that might be root causes where impairment uh, uh, will uh, correlate uh, with stuttering, meaning that higher impairment happens, or like, let's say, white matter, uh, weaker white matter is correlated with increased stuttering, whereas compensatory type things may not have that relationship. It may be the opposite, where compensatory type things are more, uh, more active for people who are uh, stuttering uh, uh, more severely. So, uh, because that circuit's forced into action more for those uh, people. So, uh, I think a two part answer one is look at kids, but also take into account the direction of the correlations between stuttering uh, severity and the uh, anomaly in question. Okay. Well, I wish we had two or three hours with you, Frank, but unfortunately, I think we're going to have to wrap up. Thank you so much for answering all these questions uh, there were many many more i i apologize if i i wasn't able oh. to get all of them today but yeah, thank you for attending. running long so yeah <laughs> all right thank you and we will wrap up have a good right. day thank you suan bye